and gentlemen, um, thank you first of all very much for coming uh, this evening, uh, and welcome to, to King's. Uh, my name is Nigel Scheinwald, I'm a visiting professor um, here at King's, and I'm the chair of the Europe in Crisis project, which is a university-wide project in which we're aiming to look at the implications of the Euro crisis for Europe's future in a number of areas, in the areas of European politics, economy and in terms of Europe's um, broader place uh, in the world. And we're running a series of events um, to, that, um, to that end. And we think this will be, hope this will be a useful contribution to the debate in Europe, but also a contribution to the um, gathering debate about British membership which is going on here. I'm delighted um, to welcome John Cridland here this evening. He's the Director General of the Confederation of British Industry. He's been in that role since 2010, but actually has worked for the CBI um, for over 30 years and knows the organization and its uh, members uh, better than anyone. As the business community's principal spokesman and representative, he's involved in debate on all aspects of this country's political and economic life as they affect business, from education and skills to our performance on exports and investment. And of course on Europe, where the CBI produced a major new report earlier this month, arguing the case for continued British membership in our national economic interest. So we're very lucky to have John here this evening. Uh, we could not have a more authoritative and respected, and respected speaker on the economic issues facing Britain and Europe in today's highly competitive international environment. Um, I understand this is John's first visit, at least in your present role, to King's, so, um, uh, with that in mind, I'd like all of us, please, to give a very warm welcome to John Cribbett. Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here at King's, and thank you for giving up your time to join me for this lecture. I'm grateful to Professor Menon and to Nigel Scheinwald for inviting me to be part of King's Europe in Crisis project and to talk to you specifically about the latest CBI report the UK, on the UK's place in Europe entitled Our Global Future. I hope you like it, but if you don't like it, the report's authors sat in the second row, that's Andy Bagnon, and you can take it up with him. For some time, I've said that the UK's relationship with the European Union must be subject to objective analysis and evaluation. Political wrangling will frankly always underpin any debate we have in this country on this issue. And I've wanted the business community to be able to present a clear evidence-based vision of our place in our complex global economy. At the CBI's annual conference in London just three weeks ago, I think the CBI was able to do just that. Our Global Future is a landmark report. The findings show how much British business believes that the best way to maximise the benefits of global trade is to remain part of a reformed European Union. And I want to talk tonight about some of the findings of the report, where I see the ideal future direction of travel. But first, I think it's important to set it in the context of how things stand today. The acute crisis in the Eurozone of the last couple of years might have calmed slightly over the last few months, but let's not kid ourselves, it's not disappeared. Eurozone countries continue to transform rapidly, and every week we get a new bit of news. Think of the recent downgrade of France's credit rating by Standard & Poor's, or Germany's trade balance now being questioned by the European Commission as being linked to the wider Eurozone's struggle to adjust and rebalance. The debate moves on. But as it does, the broad-based continent-wide downturn in economic activity begins to change direction too. The possibility of problems, problems bubbling up is never far away, but the atmospherics of the European economy begin to look a little bit better. And I think we need to remember this. We may look at the challenges of the Eurozone from the outside, but British business knows that the Eurozone's economic performance is one of the most significant 
downside risks for the UK's recovery if things do not improve. My point's an obvious one. Whether it's convenient to some part of British politics or not, we are tri intrinsically affected by what happens in the Eurozone. For none of us in the business world can kid ourselves that we're home and dry. Nonetheless, I think we've got even more evidence in the UK of economic recovery than we've yet seen in the wider Europe. A turnaround has begun to take hold here and, I hope, in the broader Europe. The Eurozone's economy is slowly showing signs of that creeping recovery, even though it's fragile beyond the core. So it's edged out of recession and it's started to grow, with deficits and borrowing costs, which not so long ago threatened to upend the single currency as a whole, now much reduced across even the weaker positioned Eurozone states. Now, finding common ground with other EU member states, taking a lead in helping to restore to stability and getting Europe growing again is, I would argue, critical to the UK national interest. We need to increase our own competitiveness too. Productivity and growth just as much as we need these things to be improved in Europe. And actually the issues we face, the issues that are on the CBI's agenda, are not dissimilar from the issues my opposite number face in Eurozone economies. And here too, after a long period of uncertainty, our economy, I think, is now set fair. The confidence we've been lacking is now swinging back into action. And you'll have seen the latest figures, but the economy has picked up more speed since the end of the summer, growing at its fastest rate in more than three years. Across the purchasing manager index figures and a range of my own CBI surveys, we've seen a significant increase in optimism, growing forward order books, indicating a broad-based economic recovery is underway. This year's GDP growth in the UK will top out at at least 1.4%, and more importantly, I'm confident we'll see UK GDP growth of around 2.5% in both 2014 and 2015. As a result, the business investment cycle, which has to date been a lagging indicator of an economic recovery, is now turning, and net trade has begun to make much less of a drag on growth than it has in recent years. Our recovery in the UK won't be spectacular, but it's solid and it's well-rooted. The central challenge for business is how we achieve sustainable growth in a fast-changing world. If we want to earn our way in the world, we need to get conditions right on the ground at home in order to focus our ambitions abroad. And some of the issues Nigel mentioned in his introduction remain mission critical for the CBI. We need a workforce equipped with the relevant skills to be more productive in relation to our key competitors, and I think particularly of France and Germany. We need to invest in our infrastructure, where we have a lot of ground to make up if we want to be world class. And in that list of essential CBI tasks, I would add the theme of tonight's lecture, that we need a reinvigorated relationship with a reformed Europe. Now, David Cameron's speech in January at Bloomberg, which offered a straightforward in-out referendum should the Conservative Party win the next UK general election, has in some ways put a question mark over our commitment to the UK's membership. It's led some commentators and indeed some politicians to advocate a straight withdrawal from the European Union. As the voice of business, the CBI is determined to help companies across the country navigate what can be an emotional debate with cold, hard facts. That's what this weighty report was all about. Now, while the offering of a referendum is rightly a constitutional matter for governments and not something the CBI in its own right would seek to influence, the answer to the question of membership for business is unequivocal. Membership of the EU single market remains fundamental to our economic future. We should remain in a reformed European Union because the alternative would leave us with much less influence. 
And the report, Our Global Future, is the biggest piece of work the CBI has done in many years. And it drills down into the narrative that Britain needs to be in a reformed Europe to underpin our global aspirations. It's not so much a matter of what relationship we've had with Europe in the past, it's where we are now, how we embrace openness and ambition for global opportunities in the future. It was no mistake or accident that we present a report to you on Europe that starts with the title, Our Global Future. So I'd like firstly to discuss maximising the openness of Britain's trading relations, and particularly with Europe, and then to touch on some of the reforms in the European Union we need to see take hold, because the core CBI mantra is in with reform, with equal emphasis on both parts of that clause. So what about openness? Well, forgive me as a historian, just going on a little audit trail. For centuries, the UK has been a melting pot of cultures and traditions, and most importantly, a long-standing player on the international stage. I think we've always been a pioneering and sometimes a buccaneering nation, a nation of reinvention, an island that's a place of ideas and innovation, industry and influence, open to trade, open to people, open to investment from all corners of the globe. It may be more visible now in the British media, this thing called globalisation. But for Britain, over generations and centuries, it's not a new phenomenon. We've always been outward looking and open, helping to shape the global political and economic landscape. And it's just developed, nurtured and evolved over time. So whereas in the 19th century, Britain forced openness through industrial dominance, in the 20th century, it became increasingly secured through the development of international rules and the founding of multilateral institutions. The Commonwealth in the early part of the century, the UN in the middle of the century, the G8 and the EU as the decades came towards the end of the century. And I think that as the world continues to transform and as we've seen more globalisation in the last decade than in my lifetime as a whole, Britain's 21st century global success is about super quick cross-border cooperation, about maximising economic interdependence, interdependence of people, of goods, of services, knowledge and ideas. So that interdependence and that global openness is evolving like cell structure yet again. It's changing. It's becoming much more complex, much richer. When people say, why aren't our export figures better? The answer is, because to export more, we have to import more. So the traditional dynamics of making something here to sell abroad become much less relevant when you look at the interdependencies of globalised supply chains. So globalisation moves apace and moves on, but the key lesson is Britain does best in that climate when we are at our most open. So we can strengthen those trade and investment links that will be the basis of our future prosperity. <coughs> if I was standing up to make a speech about European, about European scepticism, I'd probably, Nigel, have given myself a good launch pad. Because the next line would be, so why don't we leave the EU and join NAFTA? Or why don't we leave the EU and vote on our own in the World Trade Organization if openness is the answer? I don't think that is the right conclusion to draw. Even when the economic geography of the planet is moving from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere, it's still the wrong answer. Let's look at the facts. Yes, the Eastern Hemisphere, the emerging economies, the BRICS, are becoming much more significant. But as of today, less than 7% of UK's exports go to the four BRIC countries. It's clear that our import, export and investment patterns have been built up over many, many years to service other advanced economies. That's who we sell to, it's what we're very good at. They're not yet properly aligned to take full advantage of the power and significance of the new emerging economies. Over time, those opportunities grow, 
over time, we will be better positioned to take advantage of those opportunities. But in too many international markets and emerging markets that I go to on trade missions at the moment, Britain's pres presence is disappointing. Our position on a league table, particularly on exports of goods, is well behind some of our key European competitors. And what's the prospect for those markets becoming better markets for the UK? Well, each of the BRIC countries is in a different space, and I won't talk about all of them. In China, just at the moment, I suspect there's more opportunity, there's more upside. Being very contemporary and topical, I think you can see in the outcome of the third plenum signs of a newly emerging reform agenda from the new <coughs> leadership. But quite what opportunities it will throw up, we still don't know. But CBI member companies active in India would tell me that alongside the more obvious tariff and non-tariff barriers, substantial obstacles, political instability, the dying days of a government, never mind restrictive labour laws and poor infrastructure, are hugely problematic. Self-evidently, all of these markets have huge potential, but there's a long way to go before they become the predominant place for Britain's goods and service exports. At the same time, today, the EU amounts for half of the UK's trade, and around 80% of our exports go to OECD economies. So these will remain critical for some time to come. Fundamentally, therefore, the first conclusion of an assessment of our global future is that it's not an either-or choice of trading with the European bloc or trading with the rest of the world. To earn our living, to sustain living standards for our children and grandchildren, we need to do both. We need to do both better, and we need to do both at the same time. We have to look outwards to the world, fine-tune our ambitions now the more, more than we've ever done before, whilst all the time relying on our relationship with the EU, a relationship which has supported our global engagement for the last 40 years, and which, in our opinion, in the CBI, is just too important to us to give up. So to what extent can this relationship with the European Union support those global ambitions, which is a different starting point? I'm not starting with trading into Europe, I'm looking at how Europe helps us to trade around the world. Well, by facilitating trade, Europe has and will continue to be our greatest support. The single market has huge soft power selling around the world, the biggest single, single market on the planet, facilitating international investment to allow the UK to be the world's leading financial centre, providing British business with access to markets around the world worth 15 trillion sterling via more than 30 free trade agreements already signed with 50 key international partners. For free trade agreements to work, everybody has to play by the rules. And that involves pooling of sovereignty, whether it's done through the EU or whether it's done through other multilateral agencies. And I think that symbolises a very important message of why the CBI's core conclusion is that openness needs multilateral agreement. Because in the 21st century, progress more than ever will involve pooling more sovereignty in the interests of openness rather than less, in a desire to increase prosperity for all. In my opinion, by narrowly focusing on securing traditional sovereignty, we would in fact become less autonomous, less in control of our national destiny, less able to pursue our best interests. Because sovereignty, in my judgment, should be treasured not only for what it symbolises, also for what it can help us achieve. So to take an example, three quarters of CBI companies of all sectors and all sizes say that the creation of a common set of rules, product standards, technical standards, which underpin a common market has had a positive impact on their businesses. But that itself is a pooling of a form of sovereignty. My point is, cooperation requires compromise. 
But for businesses operating in a modern, complex economy, cooperation and interdependence are fundamental to their ability to export, to invest, and create more jobs here in the United Kingdom. And to those who think the price we pay in terms of pooling sovereignty is too high for the benefit we get in terms of cooperation, I think the question I'd put back would be, consider the price of isolation as we move towards the middle of the 21st century. I said our conclusion from that starting point was we are better off remaining in a reformed EU. So let me be clear, I think the EU has a lot of reform to do. It must better respect the national boundaries of member states. Of course we could survive outside the EU. No CBI that I lead will say that isn't possible. But I think we do better inside, leading a reform agenda to get a Europe which is better for business and therefore for our workforces. The challenges business face today in our global economy and will continue to face are simply insurmountable, I think, for virtually any country in Europe by solely national solutions. No alternative option, no different form of trading partnership could come close to matching this balance of benefits or offer greater international influence. In our report, a chapter I commend to you that I found particularly compelling, we looked at the alternatives, what you might call the association or semi-detached alternatives, and we looked at them with the forensic lens of a business investment appraisal. So that's look, we said, at whether Norway, whether Switzerland, whether Turkey, whether the UK as an individual member of the WTO serves us better, has more upside or not. And we concluded that while the various stages of remove implicit in these relationships might offer more sovereignty, more flexibility and some advantages, none of the options offer a better overall balance of benefits and disadvantages, especially regarding our ability to exercise influence on others. I don't want to be marginalised. I don't want to be without a seat round the table. And the most important table we have a seat round is the European Council table. With any other choice, I think the UK would be a little bit poorer and a lot less influential not able to influence the creation of rules, not able to maintain market access, and most importantly, not able to influence those global standards that the EU, global standards that the EU is increasingly helping to shape and which we should still, if we were unable to influence them, have to accept and implement. These standards and rules affect my company's <coughs> ability to take advantage of their strength on the international stage. The EU is hugely frustrating. I spent 30 years lobbying in Brussels. It remains hard work. So what about those frustrations and what about the reform agenda? Well, there's a lack of unilateral control over some regulations. And for UK firms, this is particularly frustrating and when we talk to them, the area that frustrates them most is social and employment policy. Our labour market has a different model from that of continental Europe, and I see European labour markets as a patchwork quilt of different colours and textures. I don't see it as one where one size fits all, and I don't see the case to apply the same principle of the single market that we apply to product and technical standards to something that so closely relates to nat national culture, custom and practice. And this is where I think our colleagues in the European Commission have sometimes gone wrong. They've mission creeped into areas that should be left to national decision. Commission-led regulations around social or lifestyle issues. There are many things that don't need European intervention, many things that don't need to be harmonised, Think of the proposed regulations, thankfully dropped, which sought to regulate how olive oil is served in restaurants. Those sorts of bete noirs still resonate with the British public. 
It doesn't actually matter how many of them are true and how many of them are urban myths. They symbolize a tendency for Europe to overstep the subsidiarity mark. On the very weekend we launched this report, there was coverage in the British press about proposals to harmonize the number of litres of water involved in toilet flushing. It's the same essential point. I'm not arguing to maintain the status quo, but a key point to emphasize here is that the business reform agenda that the CBI is taking to our colleagues in Europe is a reform agenda for the whole of Europe. It's not about a special deal for the UK. My R word is reform. This report does not call for repatriation of powers. I mean a fair agreement on reform across the board, across 28 member states, not a special deal for one country. What we actually want is to get the EU doing more of what it does well and doing less of what it does badly. More of helping European economies and governments to coordinate with each other, to boost the jobs and growth we need at home and abroad. And to do this, it has to reform and renew its priorities and purpose. And there are three major areas of reform I'd like to see. The first is to ensure that Europe becomes an international 21st century player in the Premier League. More outward looking, more open, breaking down trade barriers where they exist, focusing on signing trade deals like the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with developed economies and with emerging markets in Asia Pacific, East Asia and Latin America. Europe also has to be more open at home. We really want to complete the single market, to change the regulatory approach of Brussels. So a, general, a genuine single market in services, which we're well short of today, and the creation of a digital single market to reduce barriers to e-commerce, something that I think plays well to British businesses' strength in the internet revolution and actually plays well to the younger people of Europe who need to see measures taken which enhance the value of Europe to you and to them. So openness has to be a theme of a reformed Europe. Second, how the EU operates has to be streamlined. And this comes back to the point I made earlier about respecting the boundaries set by member states. Not only by organising its processes for assessing new regulations and reducing the regulatory burden, but also by focusing on growth portfolios like external trade, rather than maintaining 27 complicated commission portfolios, each with a distinct legislative, legislative agenda, bidding against each other. In addition to this, the EU that emerges from the crisis has to work equally well for all of its members. And this is a really key point. If you're looking at the European Union of the future, rather than the European Union of the past, the reality is we're now in a period of variable geometry. There isn't <coughs> one European Union. There are many European Unions different groupings of different member states for different purposes. That's the new reality. Most evidently illustrated by the Eurozone and the Europe of the 28. But that's only one variation, and there are many variations on a theme. And so a critical part of that variable geometry is that the Europe of the 28 remains secure and solid in the enhanced cooperation of the Euro, Europe of the bilateral agreements and smaller groupings. In particular, we can't have a situation where the voting power of the Eurozone can unilaterally override any of the other interests in Europe. Now, isn't that inevitable? Isn't it inevitable that we're always going to be on the losing end of the wicket? Isn't it inevitable, therefore, that we have Europe's financial capital, but because it's not in the Eurozone, over time, its influence is marginalised. No, it's not inevitable. It's in our hands, and the hands of our European colleagues, whether we can get this right or whether we can get it wrong. And I think there's already evidence that with the right negotiating strategy, we can get it right. 
We've done it, for example, recently on the banking union regulation. We've ended up with a situation where the rights of those interested in the financial services market of the 28 are protected against the automatic voting majority of the Eurozone. And that's how it should be. And this is a really important point, because one piece of baggage I had to let go in publishing this report was the view that maybe the CBI had got the call wrong a decade or more ago on the issue of the Euro. If we'd been in favour of joining the Euro, should we be listened to today on saying that the European Union is of vital importance to our economic future? My answer to that is, I want Britain to be a leading member of the EU of the 28. But I have no intention of being part of the Eurozone. And that's the accommodation that the European Union has to come to if we are to be a successful leading player. It's the choice we now face. Third and crucially, the reform agenda for Britain being an enthusiastic leading member of a reformed Europe has to start here, tonight in King's College and across London, and it has to be something that we care about. To affect the reforms we want, we must have influence. The reason we ended up with an ambitious and op optimistic reform agenda is we're convinced we have a lot more influence than people think we have, and we're listened to and wanted a lot more than the British media would give us credit for. We have self-evidently some of the highest voting shares in the Council and the Parliament, but we could have a much more dynamic presence by redoubling our efforts to strengthen our links and build alliances with other member states. Now, no matter how unglamorous the nuts and bolts of making European policy are, frankly, that's where the action is today. With more than 50% of the regulations that affect my member companies deriving in some way from the actions of that European policy-making machine. So we simply need more of our own people, British nationals, in key institutional positions to bolster our influence in Brussels. We must better use our influence to engage more effectively, not only to preserve the advantages from which we already benefit, but to get that reform agenda moving. And I'm thinking specifically of better conditions under which businesses have a license to operate. To drive these reforms, we need to be in the EU making our case, not watching from the sidelines without a voice. I'd like to see the Westminster Parliament, Nigel, taking more of an interest in what's done in Brussels in the way that some other national parliaments do, but sadly we have not. There's a real opportunity here. In this report we outline how the UK doesn't have to be on the back foot on Europe, unable to control its destiny. When the EU constructively, sorry, when the UK constructively and proactively engages, both in Brussels and throughout the capitals of Europe, we have the ability and will continue to have the ability to secure the allies and agreements that will shape the direction that Europe takes. Many of our fellow economic liberals across the continent want to work with the British if they believe the British are serious about being in Europe, but they won't waste time if we're trying to edge towards the exit door. So, in our global future, we can properly be on the inside looking out and not on the outside looking in. Our reform agenda is real. It's tangible and it's achievable. And it can allow the whole of the European Union to, fly and to thrive and flourish so that all member states can prosper. And I think this is ultimately how the UK will benefit most from being in Europe in the years to come by harnessing openness to create opportunity and ambition, and by embracing the global trends reshaping the world economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, um, for that very thoughtful and comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, we're going to have some questions. John has very kindly agreed to take some questions. When we get to that point, can you please wait for the microphone? 
um, and say your name and your affiliation if you have one. Could I just kick off? I noticed in your, um, in your biography that you've grown up in Boston in Lincolnshire um, and that uh, area has seen a huge influx of Eastern European uh, migrants over the past decade or so. Um, the Prime Minister yesterday made some uh, statements and announcements about um, immigration from Bulgaria and Romania starting in next year and some broader comments about freedom of movement in the European Union um, in the future. I wonder if um, the CBI and you personally have a reaction to those comments. So when I left Boston, Lincolnshire to go to university in 1989, the only non-white Anglo-Saxon Protestant that I could spot in my town was a gentleman who ran the Golden Dragon Chinese restaurant, of which I was a frequent user as a teenager. Um, and it was a town of 30,000 30, farmers, basically. If I go back now to see my mum and dad, it's a town of 40,000, and 10,000 of those are East Europeans, uh, Poles, uh, the Baltic states, even further afield, Ukrainians. And it has had a major impact on Boston, and Boston has moved from a sleepy market town that never got any national news to not infrequently being on the television, Nigel, for exactly the reason you've just said. But actually, when I talk to my mum and dad about this, um, there are very legitimate concerns about that impact of immigration. But they're not concerns which would turn, cause most of the people I meet in Boston to reverse our direction on EU membership or to even question the fundamental freedom, one of the four fundamental freedoms of openness in the EU, the ability to move around and live where you want. The people I talk to say if 10,000 fellow Europeans were going to come and live in our town, why didn't the government think through the implications on school classrooms and teaching in 11 languages? Why didn't they invest more in the uh, hospitals so that if you're going to have a baby, you don't have to worry about getting a bed? And why in the other half of the semi-detached house are 10 people sleeping in one of the richest countries on earth when we could afford to provide them with appropriate housing? And all of the polling shows that one of the things the public are really bothered about on the European Union is immigration. And I think that consequence of the Home Office getting it so catastrophically wrong when they told us that 13,000 Poles would come and they stopped counting after it had reached a million is a really material factor and a matter of the moment. But the answer is to explain the economic benefits of openness because those 10,000 extra Bostonians adding greatly to the cultural, economic, and social diversity of my town, and to deal with the social implications of that, which are mainly providing local authorities with the resources to deal with the consequences of rapid and major change to towns like Boston. I don't think they're to turn our back on openness. And then I think we can satisfy some of the public concerns, but I don't think they're inconsistent with a sense of direction, but overall this is an economic benefit. <coughs> yeah, let's take the one in the first row and then I'll go to the lady on the right. The microphone's just coming down to you. <coughs> yes, lady first and then I'll come to the guy. Yes, indeed.
just take that one. On the European Banking Union, Banking Authority, um, I think it's a test case and it's so far gone our way and it's a role model for other voting arrangements. So I think we will need more of the double majority situations that the EBA is just one example of. Um, how long do we wait? Well, we're optimistic about this and I think this is about confidence. This report oozes confidence. We are confident that a reform agenda can work because we think we've found the right model for reform and it addresses both your first and your second question. Reform's more likely to happen if it's reform for the whole of Europe. So we identify things which are good for Britain and then persuade Germany, Spain and Sweden, they're good for them. And reform's more likely to happen if it doesn't require wholesale treaty changes and doesn't require those treaties to be ratified. And much of what British business wants to see happen doesn't actually need treaty reform. As to whether we'll reach a point where that doesn't happen, well, it's not a prospect I'm envisaging. I think we need to persuade the British people that this is good for them because we've demonstrated the benefits significantly outweigh the disadvantages. On the first side, we've got a figure in this report, which I stand by, that I think the European Union is worth in benefit, net benefit, about £3,000 per household, per year, every year. And we know that the list of things the public and Britain's businesses are frustrated by are capable of being tackled. Now, why do I use the reform word rather than the repatriation <coughs> word? And in CBI meetings, and we have dozens of meetings all over the country, chief executives of small, medium and large companies coming together to talk about this, they rallied around reform for European business rather than repatriation for British business. I think because it addresses the same issues, but it addresses them in a way which is relevant to an interdependent economy. So if you take the working time directive, I said employment regulation was a problem, and I think the working time directive is an illustration of that problem. We're constantly on the naughty step in Brussels on the working time directive, because we overtly use the opt-out, and some people would like to see that right removed. But actually, 18 countries in the European Union make some use of the opt-out.